Greetings and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm just uh, doing a little intro video here to a longer video, but I want you to know that uh, if you're one who has been uh, a bit frustrated uh, during this uh, time of the pandemic this year, if you've been frustrated with how things may be going at your church, things aren't moving quite fast enough for you, or you think sometimes they're moving too fast and we have people uh, thinking all different ways, you need to watch this video. What I'm letting you in on today is this. Uh, we have a leadership team that we pulled together from the church here at Trinity at the very beginning of this pandemic. And we've been meeting every week or every couple weeks at the, at the longest uh, to make decisions, to talk about where we're at as a church, to talk about how we can safely move ahead, how we can offer worship opportunities with still keeping people in mind who are vulnerable in our congregation. Um, our demographic at a church like this is not quite like the school system or, or other places in life. It's a very unique demographic, and many of our uh, folks who would come to worship are older. And so we've been looking for ways uh, that we can worship together um, and do that safely. Some of that's online, some of that's uh, been in our parking lot or on our grounds, and uh, that will continue for a while if you've kept track at all of the numbers. Uh, numbers of infections, number of deaths, and so forth, uh, we are far, far, far away from the phase two that we were in in June when churches were allowed to come back uh, to church. And so we're way up into phase one. Uh, uh, you know, bottom line, when we get back to phase two, that's when we're going to start talking seriously about coming to worship inside the church. But for now, we're going to have to be patient. We're going to have to work together. We're going to have to be concerned with everyone, not just ourselves and what we want, and uh, move ahead together. But uh, this video should give you some insights into what the leadership of this church uh, has done, how they think, and so forth. And we also have a very special guest on this video as well. And I think uh, this special guest should be very helpful. So again, if you've been frustrated with any part of this pandemic and how things are maybe working at your church, please take a look at this video. I think this is gonna give you some good insights. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm John Mittner. I'm the lay leader at uh, Trinity Church here in Lamira. And uh, since the pandemic began a few months ago, uh, long months ago, uh, Pastor Ram has been meeting with a, a group of leaders from Trinity Church to just to bounce some ideas around and pray about them and make some joint decisions kind of uh, use each other as a, as a, a support system uh, concerning the decisions uh, of the ministries of Trinity Church. So this is the leadership team, uh, as uh, Ram calls it. It's meeting here tonight with uh, one additional guest. We have uh, Gordy Meatball Zimmerman, our church council chair. Uh, Kathy Drexler is our staff parish relations chair. Josh Marshy is our stewardship and finance chair. And Pastor Ram Pegram is our uh, pastor here at Trinity. Myself, I'm the lay leader, and we also uh, have guest today, Abby Sauer, is joining us. She's the Dodge County Health Chairperson or leader. Uh, we'll let you uh, formally introduce your title when we get started. So we'd like to begin uh, tonight by uh, uh, having Pastor Ram lead us in prayer. Yeah, let's take a minute and pray. Gracious God, I just thank you so much for this day. Thank you for each and every opportunity you give to us um, to help uh, lead your church here in Lamira. I thank you for this group of leaders. I thank you for Abby, too, joining us tonight. Just bless this time that we have together. Lord God, may it be beneficial to our lives, but it may, may it also be beneficial to your church uh, here in Lamira, to Trinity Church. Again, thank you for this time. Bless us with your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, Ram. Uh, along with this uh, group of leaders have met, as I said, uh, we have a, a fairly new member of the Trinity Church, uh, Abby Sauer, is a, a wife and mother of two children, uh, Warren and Veronica. And Abby also has an extensive background in the health field and is currently the Dodge County Health Officer. So welcome, Abby. Uh, in the next few moments, I'll be asking questions of our entire group here. That hopefully will give everyone more insight as, into how Trinity's leadership has been working together and why we've decided to do some of the things that we have uh, over the last eight months. 
but I'd like to uh, begin uh, first with Abby. Uh, so Abby, it's good to have you with us here this evening. And uh, uh, no offense, but probably eight months ago, most of us weren't aware that there was a Dodge County Health Department. Uh, now you seem to be in the news every day. You're kind of like a rock star, celebrity. So I don't, we want to know how you're handling that. And along with uh, helping us to understand how did we all get to where we are here in this, uh, in, in our little world of Fond du Lac, Dodge County area here in Lamira. And so after things changed drastically back in March, um, we would like to know how things have gone for you since in that time. Yeah, so thank you for the invite to come in and talk to all you and to talk to, to everybody. Um, I, I really do appreciate that. I, I want people to know what we're doing and kind of what's going on here. And you are completely correct. Most people, when I said I worked in public health, they would give me a blank look and say, what do you do? Not really understanding what public health is, but public health has actually been around for hundreds and hundreds of years in um, behind the scenes where the, the silent protectors of everybody um, and, and in, um, in Wisconsin, the state has had, a, had public health um, officials since late 1870s. And at the county level, we've had public health uh, departments and officials since probably the 1920s. Um, before that and, and during that time also there was city health officials that people um, went to for to help um, protect the public's health and help them through um, different things, communicable diseases, those kind of things. But um, it's always been kind of behind the scenes, not really in people's faces. Um, we in public health in communicable diseases, just as an example, have been um, something that's been reportable to, uh, to the state since the 1880s when um, it became state statute that communicable diseases by city officials had to be reported to the state. So um, following up on communicable diseases and uh, looking at protect how we can protect people has been something we've been doing for years and years and years. Um, myself, I have been in at working for Dodge County Public Health for over eight years and have been the public health officer for about two, two years, three months, somewhere about that, um, as a role as health officer, who is kind of um, under state statute, I have obligations of um, different things that I have to do, and one of them is uh, protecting people from communicable diseases. Um, so COVID, is what we hear so much lately, and that is considered a communicable disease, which is a disease that can pass from one person to the other. So when it comes to, um, to this new um, novel, we call it virus, it's something that public health has definitely been the lead in trying to get the word out, educate people, and um, to, to then protect the public of the, the public health of everyone, the health of all the people. Uh, so that really is a huge role um, that that you know we've been behind the scenes doing, but it's something we've been doing um, and for years. Um, and so public health really is um, we we have a, kind of our motto is that we we prevent, we promote, and we protect people uh, with. COVID-19, I can kind of talk a little bit more about that. It's, it, there's the coronavirus is a virus that has been around since identified in the 1960s, but there's many strains of the coronavirus um, that are out there. And many people may have heard of SARS, that's a strain of coronavirus, or MERS, which is uh, the Middle Eastern uh, respiratory um, virus. And that one is another uh, strain of coronavirus. And so there's many strains of coronavirus. And this is a new one that was first identified, as we all probably heard in the news, in Wuhan, China, um, and then has slowly spread across the, um, the United States or over to the United States across the world. Um, but the, the huge thing with this is that nobody 
it's new and so nobody knows exactly what it's going to do or how it's going to affect people and so we've learned a lot in the last um how many months has it been i feel like it's a blur <laughs> seven months nine months eight, eight months whatever. yeah eight months yeah. okay um you, we've learned so much about this virus if you think back in the beginning in in february or january february we we thought the main symptoms were fever shortness of breath and cough and that was really what everybody was looking at was those are the only symptoms and now all of a sudden we've identified 12 symptoms that people could have. They could have a couple of the symptoms or they could have a large amount of the symptoms. So there's so much unknown and so much that we have learned. Um, and I try to have always tried stressing that is like we are learning also. And so when public health puts out guidance at one point, it may change a month later, but it's because we've learned so much more. And the scientists and the researchers and everybody are trying to um, to learn as fast as we can what's going on with this new virus that, that has hit us hard. Um, but the, the symptoms now, I mean, it's, it's from loss of taste and smell, that's all people have is loss of taste and smell, to have, being very sick and having to be on a ventilator. Um, symptoms vary so much. Um, so, with public health, uh, the big thing that we have identified, though, is that it is spread from close person-to-person -person contact. And that's where we have been putting out a lot of guidance about staying home and keeping your social circle small and, and um, you know, in close spaces, how all those things, they can increase the chance of, of the virus spreading from person to person. So that is one way, because it's a respiratory virus, that we know that, that those are factors or those are preventative measures that can protect people and keep people from um, getting this virus. Um, the, it is, it's a highly contagious virus. That's something that was identified very early on, um, that you know, the, the, when, when somebody is ill, they can spread it um, very fast. There versus some viruses are have a slower um, contagious or the the virus the way how many people can get it at a time type of thing like influenza usually if one person is sick with influenza it ha it can spread to uh, 1.2 people is kind of what they they have that factor there where this virus they've identified it to be about three I believe three people so for every one person that gets it they can pass it on to three people can get sick. And then that just spreads out faster and faster. So it's a it's a lot more contagious than what the normal influenza virus is. There's so much more we've learned, and I don't I don't want to keep just talking, but I don't know if you have any additional questions. And yeah, given given all that, you know, all that broad picture, uh, I guess the, what we're really looking for tonight, on top of that, is uh, just a your sense if you can give us a. a just your opinion uh, or as from your position about how Trinity as a church has, has been doing to handle it. We, we're one of the few churches uh, that has not opened their, their doors. And so uh, we have, uh, as a committee, we've decided to go along with uh, and follow your, uh, your lead in terms of uh, having a plan for when Dodge County goes back to, uh, phase two uh, and so but what would be your uh, your thoughts on how Trinity has handled things and and gone about trying to function as a church in this last eight months right so again we know that it's spread person to person so easily that it's it's the best guidance that I've given is for people to not gather and not have um, larger gatherings and really if we can do um, activities in a safer manner and not gather, that's going to be the best bet for everybody. We know that this virus hits older adults the, the hardest, and we, you know, to, to get people together in, um, in church or even at, at um, you know, weddings and um, birthday parties, all those, those large gatherings are, are riskiest 
our riskiest events that can happen. And so we really need people to, to stay home and to find other ways, virtual ways, and, and you know, if it's YouTube or Zoom meetings and those kind of things, that's gonna be the safest thing for everybody. The more we get together, the high, the we're just increasing our risk of spreading it person to person. Okay. Uh, are there any other items that you'd like to share with us? Or at, I guess at this time, do we have any other questions for Abby uh, from the panel? I, we know Abby has another meeting to go to. Uh, so anyone else uh, have something to add at this point, a question? Or Abby, if you have any other comments? I do just want to um, stress the wearing of a mask. I know there's lots of um, conflicting information out there on do masks work, do they not work? It is a barrier. And so we really encourage that if people do need to uh, get together, you know, if it's at church or, or other meetings that, that masks be worn, just because it, again, it's a barrier that helps prevent um, our droplets from flying into another person. And that's where this is spread on those droplets. So if we can keep it, um, you know, in the mask, it is a barrier that's going to help. Is it 100% you know, means that if you wear a mask, you're not going to get the, or contract the virus? No, but it is a barrier and it is going to um, decrease your risk. I know it's been, you know, based, but Ram has led us in this, but we've always been figuring that if we erred on the side of caution and the safety for our most vulnerable members and as you said, the elderly, uh, and unfortunately, or uh, I guess the demographic of the church is, is skews a lot more to the elderly population than other areas. So, so that's been our focus. And so, um, so if anyone, anyone else have a question or comment, I guess, otherwise, uh, go ahead, Ron. I'm just going to probe a little bit on the whole flu thing. Um, I've heard so much that, oh, this is just like the flu. Now you mentioned about the spreading and how much more contagious this is, but is there anything else you can add to this as far as the truth about, is this like the flu? Is this not like the flu? Yeah, so I, I think maybe some year way in the future, we will say that this is a similar virus to the flu or it comes around and it affects us like the flu does. But the huge, huge difference right now is that we do not have a vaccine and we do not have a preventative treatment. And they are developing both of those and it's in the works and it's gonna come someday and then we, we will be in a better boat than we are in now. But right now we don't have those. So it does, it, it's different. That's where it's different. Right now when, when people, people have the, the vaccine as an option so they can get that flu vaccine to prevent them from getting the flu. And maybe it's not always 100% um, effective that flu vaccine, but for a lot of people it is effective and it does prevent them from getting influenza when they are exposed to it. When we have um, people who, if one member of the house has influenza or if somebody in a nursing home gets influenza, right now they give medication that will then prevent the Tamiflu, if you've heard of Tamiflu, they'll give Tamiflu to everybody before they get sick, which actually lessens their chance of getting influenza. And if they do still get it, their symptoms are way lower. Right now, we don't have either of those. We don't have the vaccine or that preventative medicine to give to people for the coronavirus or COVID-19. So at some someday when they do have that, which they will, they'll have both a vaccine and a medication. When we do have that, it will be different and, and our world will be different at that point. We'll be able to get on top of it and prevent it from spreading like it does. But at this point, that's, that's a huge thing. That's why it's so different. And that's why when a lot of our deaths lately in Dodge County have been in long-term care facilities. And it's because when one person gets it, it spreads. And we, we have dealt with outbreaks in long-term care facilities for as long as public health has been around. And I've never seen this, this many deaths in a long-term care facility from influenza, never. And, and that's why when people say it's just like the flu, it's not, it's not. And it's, it's sad because it is not. And these people 
they're they're dying. It's it's very sad. Thank you. That's, for that. that's very sad. Um, I am hearing Abby that, and I, I want to have you uh, check for accuracy on this. I've heard that last year's flu shot, which I my husband and I always get, was like 39% effective. Now I am hearing that these vaccines, that there's two vaccines that are close to moving forward. One, I think I heard was 90% effective and the other was 95% effective. So that to me is very encouraging if that is correct. Are, are the numbers I stated correct? Um, I, I can't remember exactly how, what the effective, um, what they decided for the influenza vaccine, but typically it runs around 40 to 50. Sometimes some years it is even more effective, but typically 40, 50 percent, I believe, is about accurate as far as the effectiveness of the, of the flu vaccine. And that is because in that flu vaccine, there are multiple strains that they're protecting people from. And there's multiple influenza strains that come around on a yearly basis. And we never know which strains are actually going to hit us. And so it's kind of a guessing game with the influenza vaccine on which strains are going to be hitting. And so then it, the effectiveness of it. Where with the coronavirus, there is only one COVID-19 virus. And so that vaccine is going to be for that COVID-19 virus. So at this point, there's not the many strains. And although, to be honest with this virus, it could mutate and it could change. And we don't know yet because again, it's new. But at this point, yes, yeah, the, the vaccine that um, has been tested and is hopefully going to be coming out will be about 90% effective. That's what I'm hearing as well. That's very encouraging news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very much so, right. And there's, so when the flu vaccine or when the COVID vi vaccine or COVID-19 vaccine does come out, it will be coming in a tiered approach. So we're not even sure exactly what that means and who's gonna get it when, but I can tell you that that public health is, we're already preparing and planning and, and everything for that vaccine and when it comes out. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you for all that you're doing there, Abby. Yes. Yeah, I think we all would echo that. So thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight and, and for giving us, uh, you know, giving us the information that you have and also for everything that you've done in the last eight months. And so, you know, we just, I guess on our, our end, we need to just keep providing patience and, and working and, and doing every little, every little thing that we can to, uh, you know, to, help the, the overall situation. So, so thank you. And uh, we, like I said, we know we need, you have another meeting to go to. So uh, yeah. thanks again, Abby. <laughs> thank we'll you. let you, we'll let Bye. you check out at this time. And uh, thanks again. Thank thanks, you. Abby. Bye. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Abby. All right. So, um, well, We've, I've got a, a question for uh, for each of the panel here, or the rest of the panel, and uh, or the committee, or the team, whatever whatever we want to call them. So we'll start with Meatball. Um, Meatball, one Thank of the hardest parts of being on this leadership team uh, is helping make decisions about the ministries of the church, and uh, we've all wrestled with some of those decisions, been, and it's really help been helpful to work together here. But uh, so how much? how much we do and what we can't do and so forth uh, are, you know, those are things that we've gone back and forth on. Is there one consensus about how the church should operate during these times or are there many opinions? Uh, what's been your experience uh, being part of the leadership team? Thanks, John. Um, after hearing Abby's presentation, um, I feel like the consensus is, we are doing everything that we can with this, with the projects that we've been doing, outside services, um, FM services, and it's it's just been to me it's been very rewarding because some people don't like it, but you know what? We have to do what we can do. 
and you're not going to please everybody, but there again, you know, we have some people say, well, you're not holding services. Well, yeah, we are, you know, maybe it's not in the building, but you know what? Rama has been doing a fantastic job. Priscilla, Jason, and everybody that's involved, the green team. And I just think that I, I really don't know what else we can do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my opinion. And the okay. consensus is if, if you want it in, in a number, I would say 90% of the people that I've talked to are satisfied. Are they happy? No, but they're satisfied. So, and you can't please everybody. Right. And I would encourage people to share with all of us here, your, your opinion, keep sharing your opinions with us. And if you have mm -hmm. questions and whether they're positive or negative, uh, we, we do want to hear what you're thinking. And so uh, I know, you know, that's been, uh, we've gotten both ends of that spectrum. So we'll, we'll still be here for more of those. So, all right, thanks Meatball. Um, Kathy, as the chair of the Staff Parish uh, Relations Committee, how would you say uh, the personnel, our personnel are doing and our staff, and uh, if you wanna just go through the, who the staff is that you oversee yeah. with your committee and uh, what have you seen and, and experienced during the pandemic period? Thanks, John. Um, our staff is doing remarkably well. And I watch them every day allow God to use them as God sees fit. Our staff includes Pastor Ram, Jessica Marshy, our church administrative assistant, Jason Ehlert, our church custodian, and he's the worship coordinator, and Priscilla Ehlert, our accompanist. Those folks are paid by the church to do their job. But I would add one unpaid personnel by the name of Jane Pegram, who those of us who see what she's doing realize what she's all doing behind the scenes. She's doing most of the video recording. She's helping set up and take down the outdoor service. When Jessica's computer crashed, Jane's the one who took it in for repair. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So by paying Rom, we're getting Jane for free as part of the deal. And I, for one, really appreciate what she's all doing. And I know the leadership team does as well, but I want the congregation to know what she's all doing too. I've heard every one of these people whose names I've mentioned talk and say that they will do whatever God and Trinity needs them to do. And COVID has confirmed for me that they are all God's servants. Just a little bit now on, on each one of them. Uh, Jason has already prepared our sanctuary for our return someday. Um, he is ordering um, hand sanitizing stations, all the cleaning supplies that we need to, um, to have us meet the standards that they're setting for cleanliness. And as you all know, he has sung or played his instrument for every worship service, whether it be online or in person. Priscilla has selected and accompanied all the music online and in person. And just like Jason, she's willing to do whatever we ask of her. I've learned that normal, normally Priscilla and Jason help with music at many other churches when they're called upon. They go to Lamira, to Fond du Lac, and to Mayville. And they have stated to me that they um, have stopped doing 
all of the, uh, they have no longer assisted any of those churches because they do not feel safe with indoor services right now. And so they're refusing all those requests. They're committed to Trinity. And Priscilla just told me today, we don't want to bring the germs back to our church and the people we love. Jessica, her understanding of technology is amazing. She has been a huge asset to our congregation. If she doesn't know how to do something, she will figure it out. And she has had to do a lot of that, especially at the start of this uh, COVID pandemic. She puts all the online services together. Ram makes it look like we're all there at the same time, but little behind the scenes info, we're not. <laughs> We're all there one at a time, getting recorded by Jane, and, uh, and Jessica puts it all together and gets it on YouTube. Uh, in July, when Pastor and Jane took uh, vacation, uh, Pastor Ram asked me if I would do the prayer time in his place. And the, the time he asked me to do it, Pete and I were up north at our lake home in mercer and so i was sitting at this ipad as i'm sitting right now giving the prayer time to the ipad and then somehow we had to get what i recorded to jess to get on to youtube now, it um it didn't go very well and so we were contacting her numerous times and she wasn't uh, at, at work at that time but she helped us to try to get that YouTube video prayer time that I did on so that you could see it so she went above and beyond with quite a bit of time to get that done now for Ram he and I have communicated a lot during these last eight months. Very little of it has been actually in person. It's been like this or over the phone or uh, email. He is one dedicated servant, folks. He gets his marching orders from God, nowhere else. And he cares very deeply about every one of us and our walk with God. And he wants to do his part to keep us all safe. His workload has increased exponentially due to this virus, but he doesn't complain. He's on call 24 seven for all of us and our needs. And to be honest with you, I'm a little bit concerned about him taking care of himself. So he's given me permission to bug him. I ask him, hey, did you and Jane get a walk today? Did you take time for yourself? Um, I told him that I'm hoping he will turn his phone off during dinner time so he and Jane can spend at least 30 minutes together uninterrupted. I'm hoping he's playing his guitar because that's one way that he relaxes. I know that some weeks he does better than other weeks at taking care of himself, but we need you to take care of yourself so you can take care of us. These, uh, these last eight, nine months have been very stressful on the staff and on those of us you see here today. We want to be inside of the church sanctuary as much as you do, like we did back in 2019. All of us have a slightly different opinion of what we should be doing. 
but Ram, John, Gordy, Josh, and I are meeting often, almost weekly, just like you're seeing right now. We're talking, we're weighing the data. Ram brings us information from Abby, and we've been making the tough decisions. We pray about it, and we're trying to do our best for everyone. And if you have something you need to say and forward to us, please do. Please call me. I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you, John. All right, thank you, Kathy. Um, and I think we all echo um, <clears throat> everything that you, that you just did, especially in this summary. Um, so I think we, are, we all need to just keep the lines of communication open as much as possible. Uh, Josh, um, thank you for uh, rushing from work. I know you've been especially busy in your in your uh, uh, everyday work uh, over these times. But uh, I want to thank you personally for what you've done as our uh, the chair of the stewardship and finance committee. Um, I told you the other day I feel so much better about our church and financially than I did a year ago at this time, and I think that credit goes to you for for uh, organizing and, and uh, really getting us going in, in a good direction, even especially in these trying times. So, so how is the church doing, in your opinion, in their progress toward learning more about stewardship and finance and uh, that part of our discipleship? Has the pandemic aided, helped, or uh, had uh, been a, an issue in slowing that process down? What's, what's your journey been like? Well, like you said, it's uh, being new to this position. It's been an awkward year. Uh, we got about two months, I want to say, of in-person meetings, and we were all gung ho to get started on it. And then she kind of all kind of came to a came to a halt. Uh, but we've been still plugging away meetings like this over Zoom and learning our the maximized system and doing our best to kind of understand it and figure out ways to implement it even though we're not in person. Um, the church has been doing well, all things considered, financially. Over the summer, we had great, um, some really great months of giving from the members of Trinity here. And usually, summer is a, is a downtime for, for giving. Everybody's going on vacations, and a lot of people, let's face it, if they're not in church, they don't think of the church. So to have those summer months be, I mean, huge. I mean, there was a week we had we had eight thousand dollars a week. Another week we had seven thousand dollars in giving. So that was super encouraging to see that um, we are nearing the end of the year. So you know we're really you know just kind of trying to do our best to get our the deficit down as far as we possibly can and. We posed a, a challenge a couple weeks ago to see if everybody could try to raise their giving per week by six dollars, and if your family raise it by twelve dollars to get through the end of the the end of the year. And if we stay on track, currently we've had two really good weeks at that. And if we stay on track, we will have our deficit lower than when we were at the end of last year. So, like I said, all things considered, that's a really good. A good thing for Trinity, and it goes out to all the members here at Trinity, not just, not just the, you know, the committee. It's it's everybody trying to do their part and and learn more and and move forward. We are coming up to the, you know, Christmas time here, so, you know, I just pray that members will still find a way to give their you their yearly Christmas gift, even if we're not in person. We're we're discussing different ways of maybe trying to start some new traditions here. And hopefully we can find a way to still allow people to feel a part of the church at Christmas time, even if we're not in person. And I just want you to kind of think about that going forward. That's, that's a huge part of when we receive a lot of offerings. And that usually makes a huge dent in where we're at financially. So don't forget about, don't forget about your Christmas gift for going forward here. Uh, interesting to we just ran some numbers here uh, this over the last week, and 
before the pandemic, um, we ran prior or before the pandemic and then after pandemic, we looked at numbers. And even though our numbers of offerings have gone down since the pandemic, because not as many people are in church, uh, we're down about 46% people giving. It's about 25 offerings of a week that we have not received. Surprisingly, the weekly offerings have gone up $600. So the people that are still worshiping with us and still, you know, washing online and coming to in, uh, outdoor services and FM services, I believe that what we're doing as a committee is actually working. We are changing people's thought process on their discipleship and how they need to be stewards of God and their giving. It, it seems to be working. Those numbers are really encouraging. So that way, when we get back in service, what we're doing and the people that are at worship being still with us, we can start implementing that throughout everybody. I think we're really going to turn Trinity around. I think we're going to really move forward here. So, you know, people are learning their discipleship and we're, we're trying to do that without being in person, which is very, very difficult right now. But we're doing it with emails. Uh, we started a newsletter article, uh, try to change that up. Uh, we've done some SF moments, uh, which we're, we're trying to do more often than, we, than not. But it's really hard to do those sometimes to get into the church and get it taped and put online. So we've done a couple of those. So it's just getting the information out in front of people. As far as how the pandemic has helped or hindered us at Trinity, you know, I feel the pandemic has forced us to think differently about our church and how we worship. It's made us get creative and we realize new ways to reach people. I feel these new ways have helped with the increased giving. We've gone outside of our normal and did things that we never really probably thought of doing to get to where we're at. And I don't think God planned the pandemic, but he is using it to do good things right now. And we're seeing it at Trinity. So I, I do think that, yes, the pandemic's bad, but pastor just mentioned, if you watch the service this past week, uh, the verse basically says, all good things come from God. Anything evil is not coming from God. So all good things are coming from God. And right now we're getting good things from the pandemic. He's using it to be better. So we're, we're on the right path. When SF stands for stewardship and finance, just in case somebody didn't know what SF was. Right. Okay. Hey, John, do you mind if I ask you a question? Absolutely not. Go ahead. That'd be all right. You've been our lay leader uh, for quite a while. Um, and uh, if people don't know what the lay leader is, they, they are, are basically the second in charge at the church, uh, in, in the Methodist polity anyway, and uh, kind of a go-between between the pastor and the congregation too, and uh, keeping things on an even keel there, that kind of thing. But anyway, so as a longtime member and our lay leader of our church, um, have we ever been through, I mean, you've been at this church a long time, John, like your whole life, maybe mm -hmm. has the church ever been through a time like we're in right now? Uh, uh, no, absolutely not. Not that I can remember. Um, we've had some stressful times and, and, uh, um, I remember hearing stories of when the three congregations, uh, became one and became Trinity. Um, there were some very contentious uh, meetings that, that went into that process, but uh, that's the only thing I can, I can say is that, uh, and I think we, we became a stronger trinity because of those people that were willing to work together and consider and consider each other's opinions and, uh, you know, come to the best uh, consensus that they could. So I think that that's been something that, you know, I've tried to keep in mind as we, as we hear different opinions of, uh, of people and, and rightfully so everyone has their own, their own personal experience. And so, but we've got to kind of work together with that and, and make it, uh, make it work for us. 
So um, thank you for that. Yeah, you're the one that has that vision, I think, for the long term, you know, here. Um, it, it seems like this time we're in is a time like we've never been through before. And we're having to kind of, I don't want to say make things up, but we're trying to reinvent what we do as a church uh, in, in new ways. Josh mentioned that a minute ago. But uh, do you think, uh, you know, and this is something that for five years or four and a half years I wanted to start was a leadership team, but I just never got to it. But it seemed, this seemed like the perfect time uh, to start this core group of people uh, just to come together and, and uh, because we had so many decisions to make, you know, every couple of weeks or whatever. Do you think this leadership team has been a benefit or how do you see it working? Well, I think it's been a benefit to me uh, personally just with uh, helping me be patient with all these unprecedented things that are happening to us as individuals and as churches and as schools and, you know, any other part of our community, uh, you know, patience is not something that comes easily to me and I'm sure for other people and just having this group, you know, knowing that we're going to talk things out and come up with, uh, you know, see what we can come up with as a, as a group consensus is that has helped me a lot. And, and uh, you know, when Josh was talking about, you know, how this has affected, uh, you know, the church financially, uh, you know, I always, you're always told that when a broken bone heals, that part that was broken now becomes the strongest part of the bone. And so, you know, if you look at it that way, you know, maybe this in some uh, some way or shape or form of matter has has uh, made us stronger in a lot of ways. You know, I I really believe that, and I think that you know, as we that that makes looking to the future even more encouraging and to me. So, um, yeah, I think that we're this group has been a tremendous help for me personally, and I'm and I'm sure it has. Um, for everyone else. Yeah, it has. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, well, Ram, there's, there have been some in the congregation who have asked specific questions, and we sent out a survey, um, and they've asked specific questions about worship in this time of the coronavirus. Do you mind if I ask you some, some of these specifics? No. Um, the first one would be the word fellowship. And as we've gone through this, uh, uh, the word fellowship comes up a lot. What would you say to those who are absolutely craving fellowship or togetherness at this time? Yeah, fellowship is what the church is all about. And it's also what's been the most difficult thing during this time to continue with, or we have to do it in a different... Fellowship doesn't look today like it did back in February. You know, um, I, I grew up with a mom who was a hugger, so I'm a hugger, you know, and I think I've seen that post on Facebook about huggers are really suffering right now. And uh, it, it's the truth. Um, you know, so we don't, we don't fellowship, we don't grieve, we don't shake hands. We, you know, this whole pandemic has kind of taken over our lives. Uh, but, it, you know, in spite of that, um, I, fellowship is really important. And I think that we need to uh, get it however we can. And that doesn't mean unsafely, but that means take advantage of opportunities, especially that the church presents uh, for people to at least see each other and greet one another from car to car or something like that, you know, any way we can get fellowship and have that human contact, even if it's at a distance, uh, we, we need to be doing that. Um, we're offering, you know, besides online, which I, I know for, you know, parents with kids and so forth, that's a lot easier sometimes. But uh, for many, they just want to come to church. And so coming to the parking lot even is at least one way they can do that right now. And we're offering a worship service every Sunday at nine uh, via FM transmitter, where we're set up in a classroom in the church, myself and the musicians, and we broadcast that uh, message and music, uh, and people can come in, tune in their radio, and at least see others, you know, and be a part of a larger group. Um, so that's one way. Is it ideal? No. Is it what we want? No, but it's at least what we can do for now. And the other thing is, is uh, the staff is working really hard to come up with ideas, uh, especially during the upcoming holidays, of things we can do so that as a church, we pull things together. We pull ourselves together and say, we are the body of Christ. And these may seem like small things, but right now we're having to be creative and come up with whatever we can. And the latest is this. So I'll give you a little preview. 
But on Sunday, December 20th, I think it's around 6 p.m., more details are coming on this, uh, but we're going to have an event called Caroling in Your Car. Um, and it's a chance for families to get out for a few minutes, to uh, come over to the church parking lot in their car. The Alerts are going to be doing Christmas music, vocally, instrumentally, so forth, uh, during that hour. I think there's going to be some other things involved, maybe two at that time. There may be some Christmas flowers involved or something, but we'll let you know about that. But anyway, that's happening on December 20th, but we're trying to come up with events where fellowship can take place. And so, you know, my, my response is just get it wherever you can. Take advantage of what's going on and what the church has to offer. Uh, don't hold back on those opportunities. Um, you know, again, it's not, it's not what we want it to be, but um, let me just say, too, and I don't think this is prophetic. I think this is just a fact, and Abby even said it. Well, once the uh, vaccine comes out, I think things will begin to change, and sooner or later we'll get back to kind of a norm and, and – uh, it's not time right now to throw down all the barriers and get back together again, but that day is coming. I want, you, I want everybody to know that, that that day is coming. And uh, you won't have to wonder when that day is because everybody's going to be rejoicing, including this pastor. You know, uh, we're all looking forward to that day to come. So get involved where you can. So you've already released guidelines for a time when we add another worship inside the building and uh, to all what we're already doing. Some question why there are so many guidelines. Uh, what explanation would you give them? Well, it's kind of twofold here, and I'll do this briefly. Um, uh, my answer would be for the safety of all. Um, we're, we're not making up how we move forward. We're trying to follow CDC guidelines, the guidelines of our county health officer, our state. Uh, we've also got folks at the conference level. Uh, they have a COVID task force that has at least two, if not three, physicians on that task force and some nurses, medical folks, in other words, uh, that are sharing their advice as well. And so we're taking our cues from them. So we, we want to move forward, um, but we want to move forward uh, in a safe way also. And, and I will say this, and I think I can speak for all of us here, when, anytime we've thought about a decision we have to make over the last eight months or so, um, we, we always at least in my mind, I always picture some folks from our uh, congregation and the most vulnerable. We picture the most vulnerable. So we've been worshiping the way we have been because we can involve the most people safely. We want the most people involved. The, the minute you move inside, you've got to cut the numbers way down according to guidelines and, and do this kind of thing. So, but anyway, the reason that all those guidelines are there is for safety, number one. But number two is this, and I think this is a very important reason. Um, the other reason for so many guidelines, if I can quote what you just said, is that we've uh, learned from many churches that have already gone through this process that the more organized you can be as worship leaders, the better things are going to run. But also, and here's our goal the less people are going to have to think about rules and guidelines because everybody's going to know what they are and just do them. Uh, but the main thing is, is so they don't have to concentrate on that. They can actually come into the building and concentrate on worship. And that's our goal. We want people to come in and really worship, not having to be worried about this or that or the other. So if everybody's doing the same thing and we're really organized in that way, that'll help people just be able to concentrate on what we're there for. And that, that's our main goal, I think, besides safety. Is there anything that you can recommend that uh, members of Trinity uh, spend their energy on these days in order to uh, be helpful to this congregation? What, what can we ask of our members to help us get through this? Well, thank you for that question. I appreciate the opportunity to answer that. But uh, a couple things. Uh, one is, and, and these are all Christian things to do, by the way, because we're a Christian church, right? But the first thing is, is continue to pray. Um, you, you want to, it's like, I've always wanted to be a better prayer in my life, you know, better at praying, taking time to pray, spending time with God. This is the perfect time to do it because we have less distractions that we can go to. Um, so I would say, please continue to pray, but pray specifically for your pastor, your church staff, your leadership. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. We need people's prayers as we make decisions for everybody. As, as Gordy said earlier, um, you know, not everybody's going to be happy, but we, we have to do our best to kind of uh, sift through uh, how people are feeling and what the guidelines are and come up with the best 
uh, decision possible. But, um, uh, you know, I, I just believe we need people's prayers. And if I could just interject this about this group here, um, I said this to Kathy earlier, and so I'm going to say it to you. Some of you may use different terms or different analogies, but I really appreciate this leadership team. Um, you know, we do need people's prayers for sure as we lead. Uh, every leader has a different style. Every pastor has a different style. Uh, my dad and I, for instance, my dad was a great pastor, but he and I are not alike in this. Uh, many pastors are solo artists. They, they are technically able to make the decisions by themselves, and so many just do. Uh, I've always appreciated playing in a band more than being a solo artist. So you guys are the band, okay? Uh, just so you know, but this band needs prayers. We need people's prayers. And the other thing is intentionally stay connected. Intentionally stay connected. This is so important, and I mean spiritually speaking. Uh, we have a choice of disconnecting or staying connected um, to our church. And that decision is always intentional. It's, an, it's a decision of the will. It's, it's what we will to do. Uh, but these days, if we're not intentional about staying connected somehow, uh, we're the ones who are going to miss the support and the fellowship and the general connection to the body of Christ. Um, such a temptation these days to, to crawl into a hole somewhere and just kind of hole up there and not be involved. But uh, spiritually speaking, we can't do it on our own. We need each other. And so, again, just stay connected, uh, pray and stay connected. Those are the two things that I think will benefit not only people individually, but also the church as a whole. Thanks. All right. Well. I think uh, we've covered as many bases as we can here tonight. So uh, unless someone else has anything they'd like to add, I guess I'd like to just uh, wrap this up real quickly. And uh, just a couple things that I'd like everyone to know. Number one is that we are still Trinity Church. Uh, you know, and, and it things look a little different. Uh, at times, but we, you know, that's what, that's what we are. We're a living um, body of Christ. And so this is just uh, a temporary thing, hopefully, but we are still Trinity church. We still have our, our identity. And uh, um, that means a lot to me. We will be together physically, uh, not just spiritually, right? Right now, I feel like we're as together spiritually as we've been in a long time as a congregation and we'll be together physically uh, in faith soon hopefully soon and I and I'm you know I, I try to go through life and my dad modeled this for me in his last few years uh, on this earth that you know you can choose a direction that you want to go you can choose to like Ram said before disconnect and go crawl in a hole and, uh, and, you know, to wait till this is over. Or you can choose to be optimistic. And it doesn't cost you anything to be optimistic about something. And that's the way I'm going to choose to go, go forward. I put my Christmas tree up a few days ago. Um, and I'm looking ahead, not behind. So, and I think that this group has done that too. And it's given me the opportunity to do that. So we are a group. As a group, we're here, uh, as we've said several times. So, if you're a member of Trinity or if you're not a member of Trinity and you're watching this for some reason, uh, feel free to contact any, any of us. And uh, if you have any questions or concerns, but please reach out. And that, that to me uh, would, would uh, you know, mean that this is worth doing. And uh, so we didn't want to waste anyone's time tonight. We wanted to give as much information as we can, but that's the way I feel about things here. And I think, the vaccine that they've announced, uh, you know, every little bit of that good news really does help you with the, you know, the optimistic belief that God's going to lead us, lead us out of this. And so that's the way I'm approaching things. And uh, I would love to hear from uh, more people uh, regarding how they're handling things and, and uh, as we go forward. So, uh, so thanks Ron for setting this up tonight and, and uh, for the idea and, and, uh, I hope that this helps uh, anyone that watches it 
And so um, you want to, uh, would you mind uh, taking us out with a prayer? You can do that. Uh, my thanks to all of you too for tonight. Okay. I appreciate it. And every week that we meet. So let's close in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we just thank you so much for this time we've had together tonight. I thank you for these leaders of Trinity Church. I thank you for the gift of Trinity Church and that all who are listening, we can all be a part of this body of Christ uh, here in Lamira and uh, beyond. And Lord, we just pray your blessings on all that this church does in the future, that you'll help us through this very difficult time, but help us to love one another, kind of over the top, love one another and care for one another, uh, but help us through this time and uh, be with us in the season to come and in the year to come. Uh, watch over us, continue to lead and guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.